Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hearthstone Championship Tour America's Summer Preliminary. My name is TJ, and joining me to start off the day is Saddle. Saddle, how you feeling, man? I am feeling fantastic. Had a great time last week at the Europe Preliminary. I'm now here as the European interloper towards towards the Americas. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Indeed it is. The, the, the sole British man, unlike last week. Uh, but it's going to be a fun weekend. The last preliminary uh, of the year, actually, for the Americas region. So it should be fun. Uh, if this is your first time tuning into one of the preliminaries, have no fear. We'll give you a rundown of exactly how it works. Uh, players have earned points, uh, Hearthstone Championship Tour points, throughout the year by either competing in uh, online ranked play or by placing highly in online open cups. There are also 32 players competing in the preliminary today that uh, won local Tavern Hero events uh, at their firesides. And of course, we're here this weekend as uh, each of those region's best players, each of America's best players are entered into one giant double elimination bracket. That's right, TJ, and we take that double elimination bracket and we run it through until there are just eight players remaining. And those eight players will be the qualifiers for the America's Summer Championship. And this tournament has a, an extra edge to it, an extra level of importance, because it's the last chance for, the, for a seasonal qualifier for any of these players to get to a championship and potentially book their spot at BlizzCon. And that means that some players, like, for example, uh, Rosti and Chucky, are looking for a, a second shot, having come so close at previous championships already. Whereas there's some people, like previous world champions Firebat, who haven't even had that shot yet, and this is their last chance to make their way through a preliminary. Yeah, many up-and-coming players with uh, world championship hopes this is this is their last chance, so uh, the stakes are very high. And also the stakes got a little bit higher this week as mm. Karazhan is available. So new cards, uh, the prologue and week one of Karazhan were available to the players when they were submitting their deck list. So uh, there is the potential that we might be seeing some ivory knights, some pantry spiders perhaps. Yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, but it should be really, really fun. Uh, I hope we get to see some of those new cards in action. Uh, but yeah, uh, we talked about uh, the World Championship, and we talked about how this is the last chance for some of these players. Uh, but for some of these players, there's even another element to it. Uh, this is the last call. The top eight players from each region in total Hearthstone Championship points throughout the entire year will be invited to a last call tournament after the Summer Championship. And right now, there's the top 16. So the players like VLPS, Chalky, Knoblord, PhoneTap, Astrogation, these players, not only do they wanna try and qualify for the championship, but if they don't, they wanna make it as high as possible to get as many points as possible to try and make it to the last call. That's absolutely right. And a couple of thing, other things that stand out for this to me. First off, Muzzy and Frozen topping the list is just incredibly impressive because many of the other big names on this list have got a big chunk of their points through either succeeding in prelims or qualifying for championships or a combination of both you know these tournaments in particular offer big chump chunks of hct points which means anyone in that top 16 first off the players who are already in the top eight will be wanting to do well to defend those spots but those numbers eight through 16 also if they can do well have a good run in this prelim and even get to championship and have a good run there they are still in with a shout to qualify through the last call Indeed, and for the rest of the players that aren't in that top 16, the America's preliminary is the last chance. Yes, indeed. Uh, so to give you guys a bigger look at all of the players participating in this preliminary, let's go ahead and check over with Frodan, who's standing by with some of our friends at the Blackboard. Greetings and welcome to the Blackboard. My name is Frodan Sensei, and today I'll be your Violet teacher joined with the Violet Apprentices. I have Brian Kibler, my straight-A student. I have Nathan Admirable Zamora, and of course the teacher's pet, Cord Songbird Giorgio. So how are you guys doing? How are you doing, Nathan? It's the first time we see you in a preliminary. Well, I'm pretty sure Sorcerer's Apprentice is what it makes, but uh, yeah, really happy to be here. <laughs> happy to see where the predictions go for this one. And uh, more importantly, to see how the new cards actually influence how players choose their decks. I don't think we're going to see any screaming new archetypes, but happy to see what players can tech in. At least not yet. For more of the cards being released, we do have a lot of fun. I think Wing 2 is inspiring a lot of new ideas. That's what I'm really excited for. Uh, we do have Wing 1, which does have some of those new cards as well, which I'm really excited about. I'm also excited to see which players are going to be able to go through. Let's go ahead and introduce them to the audience of the regions that each player is participating. We have 168 players this weekend from North and South America, and even more 
locations. We're going to start things off on U.S. West. Yeah, uh, California has a lot of representatives. Uh, we see the Esports Arena location in Santa Ana. A ton of well-known players. Uh, Rosti, the finalist from last season. Astrogation, Zelay, Ture, uh, all the way up the coast to Seattle and San Jose as well. LOK, Shadow, Bradford Lee. A lot of big names. Yep. Uh, in U.S. Central, we do have some notable names as well. People are familiar, of course, with players like Dog and Just Saying. Of course, uh, the Winter Championship finalist, Chess Dude, who's also number three in points. Definitely can't sleep on U.S. Central. Yeah, and then even head over to the east, you look at how stacked it is at the Fairfax location. Uh, with Chalky and Muzzy being new additions to Luminosity Gaming alongside Frozen and Phone Tap. Uh, there's just a stacked amount of talent that's at Fairfax, including Winter's America Championship. And of course, we can't forget about Canada. Only two locations, but plenty of big names represented. Neobility, BB Gun Gun, Fibonacci, all really competent ladder players, Hot Form Purple, and of course, Cydonia, the America's Spring Champion. Yep, Latin America can't be slept on either. We've always had one player representing the championship. The previous season was PNC. In winter, we had Snail, who makes his reappearance in summer. That's a job well done there. I'm looking for breakout performances from Latin America, too. I, I've been talking about Leo Manca Gloran for a while. I'm feeling this is their season. And then Tavern Heroes just qualified yesterday. Some well-known names in here, usually uh, mostly unknowns, but we see uh, Dart as well as Brian the Rat Cortade uh, showing up through the Tavern Hero Championship. It's uh, something to do with the Bryans, but I'm sure you guys had that special connection, or maybe it's just admirable starting the <laughs> memes. Uh, as with always, guys, with our preliminary, we're going to do some predictions just to give you guidelines on who we think, whether it's known or unknown players, uh, some of the players that do qualify. It ends up becoming a fun story, or we end up being all wrong like last week. If you guys didn't see it, uh, we all of our predictions were wrong. That's a fun story, too. That is a fun story, too, <laughs> in, in a sense. Uh, but it won't get us sapped regardless. So we're going to go straight into it. Cora did get the first pick. Keep in mind that this is an exclusive snake draft. Me and Cora got first and last pick, and I got the pick two simultaneously when it came to my turn, and it is exclusive. So, Nathan, can you please remove the first name here on the top left? Cora had the first pick, and this shouldn't surprise many people. She went with Chalky as one of the players who's been very commonly seen at the top of America scene. Yeah, Chalky has had a great year so far. He had a great finish in DreamHack Austin, as well as he was represented in the America's Winter Championship. Was a favorite to win it, but didn't actually take it all. Didn't even make it into the top four. So I'm really excited to see if he can come back this time and make it to the Summer Championship. It's his one of his last chances to make it to BlizzCon. So I, I'm, I'm putting some money on him. I think he's going to do really well. Yeah, and I, I feel I feel pretty confident in that if, even if Chalky doesn't qualify this season, he has a very strong chance over two tournaments to potentially make it through, but it's very competitive. Only two spots remain. Uh, Sottle was our second pick. Now, he's not joined with us, and he makes a pick that I think a lot of other people would not be surprised. Uh, you can go ahead and rip it, Nathan. You don't have to make it so dramatic. <laughs> Uh, it's just Saiyan from Temple Storm. Uh, he says specifically that he feels like Saiyan has a, an amazing understanding at reading the meta. Uh, he agrees with almost every single point of analysis that he has when he's watching a stream or making his decks or pointing it out. So it's a very strong pick based off Sado's resonance of ideology with Hearthstone and Saiyan. So I, I, I can't really disagree there. Any thoughts? I, th I think you might be a little bit biased. You I, know, being I a Temple am a Storm biased. player, but yeah, I <laughs> Any, mean, anybody disagree can say it, <laughs> leave the stage immediately. <laughs> say it has has performed very well recently, and uh, you know, definitely a strong pick. Fantastic, uh, Kilbert, You were the third pick. Uh, you decided to go with Firebat, 2014 World Champion. I want to say why, but I don't really feel oh, like you, you why actually just said why. why is the 2014 World Champion. Well, I mean, that's my job. I'm supposed <laughs> to ask you why. Well, I mean, Firebat, you know, he he's a player who's branched out quite a bit uh, recently, doing casting as well as a lot more streaming and things like that. But he's clearly just a, a super super competitive guy. 2014 World Champion definitely has the fire to get back this year. Oh, certainly, and he's been doing a lot of good content. People have been respecting his authority more and more as time goes on, which is a pleasure to see. It's only his first chance in the year to qualify for BlizzCon. He hasn't actually participated in the winter and spring season. Uh, it could be one of those one-hit wonders again for the year. TJ was the fourth pick here. Nathan, would you go ahead, my lovely assistant? 
Frozen, the person who is currently number two in points just by one. Him and Muzzy have been going neck and neck for a while. Uh, TJ said that he feels like Frozen is one of the most, if not the most consistent player because he does have recent results in Dream Hacks, for example. And he also really likes his decks because he brought some really cool ones like Control Shaman and a few other Control decks. Do you have any opinions? You've been, you're pretty close with some of this group. Yeah, so Frozen to me has always been a very interesting player because he'll play decks that are a little bit off the wall, but he'll also add his own twist to them as well. Uh, I think about a Freeze Mage deck that he played recently where he had Yogg-Saron in the Freeze Mage deck and it was quite literally to help fight the Dragon Warrior matchup. He said you just needed more gas because you spent everything. That's one Freeze Mage deck I can enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Admirable, why don't you go ahead and reveal your pick as well? Yeah, so, so you can go ahead and chain that. For my pick, I wanted to go with someone who not only has been performing very consistently, but also needed to perform at this event in order to solidify himself the best chance possible to be in that last uh, that last call and solidify the spot. And so for this one, I think Nostum is just on the top of the game right now. I think he's one of the best players in North America, arguably the best, and I think he's going to perform at this event in particular. He's, he's had incredible results this year. Year. He was sort of under a lot of people's radar, but then he finished, you know, second place in the winter season to uh, Amnesiac, and then just missed out losing in the elimination rounds last season for the uh, the preliminaries to make it to the championship. So, very strong player. I went with two, so go ahead and strip both of those for me. Ooh, <laughs> wow! You don't know your own strength, been Nathan. To the yeah, gym. Wow. <laughs> really been working out. Yeah. <laughs> that forearm strength. <laughs> so I went with two. I went with a head pick and I went with a heart pick. Uh, I can't really go against Amnesiac after watching his results both in winter and spring. He probably could have made spring if he wasn't uh, such a loyal and faithful brother to his family. Uh, he did his Tens of Sisters graduation and I was doubting him a little bit in spring in the sense like, you know, I don't think he cares as much. I don't think he has that drive, but he does. And, he, and I think now that other people have qualified back-to-back -back seasons, I think that motivates him to also prove that he can do it too. So I'm not going against Amnesiac one more time. And Fibonacci, I just love his decks. His decks are so cool. I don't think they're the best decks, but I, if there's one person that can always win despite the odds because of his weird deck, it's Fibonacci. Uh, it, it remains to be seen if his strange deck selection can be as effective in an environment where everyone knows the contents of everyone's decks. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's definitely a strong player who's put up uh, a lot of results in the past. Yeah, highly recommend you go check out his decks. Uh, Admirable, go ahead and show your second pick here as we're running out of time. Yeah, so for my second pick, I went with Yoetz Flo, a player that isn't often thought of when it comes to picking very top competitive talent, but I know he's got a great mind for the game. He practices a lot with Chalky and Nostum, and is just such a fantastic player, understands his matchups really well, and that helps him execute. Yeah, uh, Chalky attributes his first and only Premier Tournament win, DreamHack, uh, this year to Yoetz Flo, his main practice partner, who brought the same exact lineup. It could have been him winning, and then all of a sudden we're talking about him as one of the more known players, so I don't think that's a bad pick at all. TJ's second pick was is Vank Swisher. Now this one was a little left field and it wouldn't be a prediction, a caster prediction segment without some uh, very interesting picks. And he says the reason why is because he watches his stream a lot and he really feels like he has a, a very decent grasp on the game. Uh, not to mention that he feels like he's on the upswing. He's just been winning a lot and these kinds of momentum really does carry over. You know, player need to have confidence in what they're playing in their lineup and he feels like he can be the one. So TJ's going for a lot of brownie points on this one. He also just has a great name. So Yeah, Vank Swisher. Great name. Yeah. Kibler, second pick. I actually really like this one, too. You chose Rossi, yeah, a I, finalist from Spring. Rossi was actually the player who really popularized the Dragon Warrior archetype uh, after success, not only at preliminaries, but also, of course, championships last season. Uh, he's actually brought not only Dragon Warrior to this event, uh, but a new Beast Druid deck. And, you know, it'd be interesting to see if this sort of aggressive variant on an old favorite has what it takes to pay off uh, for Rossi again. Yeah, I, th I said the last season that Rossi reminded me of, like, another version of Firebat in a different way. I, thought, I do feel like uh, it's not a coincidence that you chose both these very calculating <laughs> players. Sato's second pick was Chess Dude. Now, I know Chess Dude is a player that you were like, when Susie picked him, you're like, oh, I really like Chess Dude. And why don't you go ahead and explain why, Cora? Chess Dude was just, he, he was obviously a fan favorite from the winter season. Chess Dad became, you know, everybody's favorite parental Maybe figure, I suppose. Maybe more popular than Chess Dude. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more popular, but Chess Dude has had some amazing finishes on ladder with his rogue decks. He's a very, very talented kid. And you know what? He He's definitely maybe 
still a bit of an underdog, but I'm really excited to see what he can do in this tournament, and I think he's definitely a solid pick for Saddle. Yeah, I'm always scared about Rogue, but it's one of those things that if there's players that can make Rogue work, it's players like him, players like Purple, players like Sam, etc. If Chalky's playing Rogue in a tournament, which he is in this yeah. tournament, it might be in a good spot. It might be. Chalky does not like Rogue. It's tough to convince We've him to play Rogue. We've all seen the spreadsheets. <laughs> it's very difficult. Speaking of which, you picked Chalky, and you had the final pick the final say, and you also decided to go a little bit left field. It's LBYS. Why don't you go ahead and explain that? I did. You actually said that you went sort of with a head and a heart pick, and I did pretty much the same thing. LBYS, uh, I was actually on a team with previously. Uh, I've practiced with him and, and other players, Racy591, Ginge, other players that qualified for the preliminaries, and he he's just a player that really is very calculated. He's very promising, and he's very well known for his freeze mage, which is, you know, not mine and, and your favorite Dax Kibler, but it's definitely one that's very difficult to play so he has a very high skill level and you know what in this case give one to a friend and i really do think he's got a great shot well you're gonna look brilliant if it ends up making and i do feel like we do have a couple of freeze mage players who always make it very far and and if not actually qualify for the championship and then bring it to championship so i think you're probably onto something there cora and that should wrap up our prediction segment what do you guys think of our predictions who are your predictions let us know hashtag hct whether it's on twitter at play hearthstone or facebook.com slash hearthstone and also if you're able to step away and take a break from the broadcast we'll be posting all the replays and the results on on the social media feed so that way you guys can stay up to date despite all this chaotic bracket and with that let's go ahead and get ready for our first series of the day tj and Saddle are ready to go so let's get ready for our first match which is dog versus snow thanks very much dan the stage is set Saddle, dust off your boots Ooh. it's time to watch the real region play wow <laughs> okay i mean Pressure's on you guys. If the players out there, you now have that, that lofty statement to live up to. Indeed. And uh, as for the match, first match of the day is Dog versus Snow. And uh, Dog, of course, a well-known player uh, in the Americas. Snow, maybe not so much. Yeah, Dog, definitely one of the biggest names in this tournament. One of the, the biggest streamers, for sure, has the most eyes on him. Snow, not so much. We tried to do a little bit of research on him just before we came online. Uh, found out that he is, by looks of things, a Chinese-American player. Mm -hmm. um, definitely in his decks, you can see some of that Asian flavor. They have a little oh, bit, yeah. few different opinions on uh, how to build some of these decks than we do in the West. And uh, TJ, the look on your face is, uh, is giving it all away right now. Uh, I heavily disagree with his tempo mage deck but I, yes uh it's very weird um hopefully we get, we will get it to uh see it in play hopefully because it, it wasn't banned away nope. and I, i'm excited to see it's got like double cabalist tome one cult sorcerer some weird tech cards in there so interested to see how that one's going to perform uh but it is sort of an alternative and not many people know how to really play around sort of these alternative deck styles sure. of common archetypes and so that might be a little bit of a of an edge even though dog knows a deck list he might not know how to most efficiently play against it yeah the thing that surprised me the most is looking at that tempo mage list he chose not to include firelands portal in it which is obviously one of the new cards that is available mm -hmm. to him but on that note this is an azoth paladin coming up here from dog which does in fact include ivory knight as a single copy so we could get game one match one mm -hmm. new card action right here if there's anything that Kabbalah's tome uh can do well it's play better against control <laughs> you, you laugh, uh, but no, I, I, that, okay. that statement is entirely accurate. I'm just looking at this opening hand of the Tempo Mage filled with fabled high temple ca tempo cards like double Kabbalist Tome. Yes. Like, yeah. Uh, so uh, the reason why is uh, I've seen uh, players do extensive testing. I've done exten extensive testing of my own, and Kabbalist Tome is uh, by far the lowest win rate card when played in traditional Tempo Mage decks. Um, yeah. So, it, even though it can give you that extra gas that you need against control decks, sometimes it just whiffs, sometimes it's too slow. Mm -hmm. It's a risky pick to make in a meta where a lot of people are bringing fast decks like Dragon Warrior and Aggro Shaman. Right. Uh, so, just some of the reasons why I 
don't like the choice as much as others. Yeah, I can support that. I think it's something, it's something like three weeks before I lost a game to Tempo Mage that played the card Cabalist Tome against me playing Hearthstone. Can't even remember. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was seriously a really, really long time. But yeah, this is one of my least favorite cards in the game. I think it might come into its own later on when we start seeing sure. more viable Control Mage archetypes. But right now, not looking very promising as the, the early exchanges here have gone back and forth. Uh, Snow tried to generate some board pressure early, trying to hide that uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice behind the mirror images. But unfortunately, Dog was just able to consecrate the board away. And now he has a nicely contested Acolyte of Pain against the Blood Mage Thanos. Indeed. Uh, Dog's a player who is, we've talked about well-known, but hasn't traditionally performed well in preliminaries. No. Uh, in winter and spring, he uh, did get out pretty uh, reasonably early, mm -hmm. and despite being able to qualify for all three, he hasn't really solidified his spot in last call. He hasn't done well in the preliminary, so this is a, a player who, if he wants to make it to BlizzCon and uh, do his fans that service, he's going to need to perform well at this event. Yeah, certainly will. I mean, it's, I think Dog can sometimes suffer because he's he's somewhat of a deck loyalist. He definitely has flavors of decks that he likes to play. Uh, you can see that even in his Yogg Druid list, which sounds weird because Dog is classically a Ramp Druid loyalist, but you can look at his Yogg Druid list and he's cut out a lot of the token stuff. Like he's playing Scenarius instead of Anixia. He's playing extra Druid of the Claws, for example. So you can see that like deep oh, in his wonder. in his canine soul, he really wants to be playing Ramp yeah, Druid. Just wants to taunt up. Yep. That's all he wants to do. Yep. Uh, but yeah, uh, Dog's Paladin deck is also a little bit greedy. Uh, he has included that Ivory Knight, as you can see. And Ivory Knight, not only does it give you that extra bit of healing, but it also sometimes just gives you, you know, extra gas. It gives you that even more healing if you can pick up a Lay on Hands or uh, even sometimes Forbidden Healing. You heal for zero on the effect, but you have the Forbidden Healing for later. So interesting interaction. I, I really love this usage of, of Doomsayer from Dog. I think this is uh, one of the strongest ways to use Doomsayer in a deck like this, where you don't have a hard lockout like Frost Nova to go along with it, is you, you create kind of a win-win scenario where you develop Doomsayer on a board where you already have one or two minions, which feels counterintuitive, but you basically say to your opponent, like, you have to let me reset the tempo here, and otherwise I just get to keep my other minions as you clear out a Doomsayer. But while I've been waffling mm. on about Doomsayers, we have seen the debut New of card. our Karazhan cards. Oh my goodness. Take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but yes, uh, you can see Dog is uh, sort of having trouble with this choice. Uh, it, this is not a Murloc and it's off Paladin or right. Murlocs by any means. So anything can happen is not a good choice. It was between uh, Steel of Champions or Blessing of Might, I think. And Seal of Champions just sort of is the same thing, just better but higher costed. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're in a longer game like this, you're probably going to be able to fit in the Seal of Champions. So I feel like that's usually going to be the better choice. What to hey. do? I what bet Snow do? wishes that Cabalist Home was a Firelands portal right now. I bet he does. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. He could kill a minion and also summon a minion. And do you know, do you know what? a single card. Do you know what killing a minion and playing your own minion at the same time is really good for? Tempo. Tempo. Indeed. Mm. We solved it. <laughs> Pack it up, boys. We solved the meta. Well, this looks like a good Kodo target to me. Oh, yeah. And I, I, Snow did go with the Frostbolt to face. Not only does uh, Frostbolt's never, not really going to get more damage than five, and also one of the uh, strongest counters to Flame Waker yep. is the True Silver Champion. At this stage, Dog has already drawn a lot of cards. Mm -hmm. Very likely that he has one of those, and he does. So Snow realizes that this is probably going to be my only chance to push damage if my Flame Waker can survive a turn. Yeah, I think the, the deck lists are revealed in this tournament. It's an important thing to remember. So Snow will have looked at Dog's lists and know that he's playing double True Silver, double Kodo. Yes. So the chances that there was one card in hand that killed that Flame Waker was incredibly high. So he at least chose to play around the True Silver outs mm -hmm. and made him have Kodo. Yeah, there, there are ways that this deck has that allows it to sort of play around Kodo. Uh, mirror Image is one of them, but this deck only runs one Mirror Image, which is not currently standard in most right. Tempo Mage lists. And we saw that that was cleared off. So there's no way that you can try and save that Flame Waker to make it have less of a chance of getting killed by both. So uh, now Snow's kind of in, I, I don't want to say he's in trouble because this deck packs a lot of burn. But again, deviating from uh, standard here for Snow, um, he, oh, nope, he, he actually, well, he runs one Cold Sorcerer. So a little bit less spell damage, mm. not quite as much reach. 
This is a, an interesting turn here for Dog. It looks like he's scared of Mirror Entity, knowing that essentially these secrets could be from Kabbalah's Tome. He knows that one of them is if he was tracking the hand correctly. So it could be anything here. But I don't really see the harm in attacking face with the Kodo first and establishing that it's Ice Barrier. Like, it could be Vaporize, but in this deck, like, sure, you can try and get a 1-1 one -one Vaporized, but the Mage can always ping it to prevent that. So mm -hmm. what are you really going to get Vaporized? And in this situation, if he's going to go ahead and attack anyway and get the news that it's Ice Barrier, wouldn't you rather just jam Rag Light Lord into play right now? Yeah. Maybe a little bit of missed sequencing, but it's... Uh, you can't... Ah, I was going to say you can't really blame him, but yeah, in so those types of situations, you kind of can. It would take some pretty high-level hand tracking because you'd have to know which secret in which position on the mage's portrait was played from the position that's from Kabbalist Tome, and then see that that secret activates when you attack face. Yes. So you rule out the ice barrier as the weird card, then you know the other secret is ice block, and therefore you can play rag. I mean, that's a lot of attention to detail, but that's the level we should be expecting in this kind of tournament. Exactly. It's a level of attention to detail we should be expecting from Dog, who's been a staple in the competitive scene for so, so long now. Sure. And, uh, Snow is going to realize that probably not going to win the long game, so let's just start chucking some burn at the face. Mm. Uh, unfortunately for him, though, well, now Dog is in a little bit of an awkward spot. Because of that not banking that eight healing last turn, he doesn't have the guaranteed eight healing from the rag this turn. Because he's forced to trade into the Mana Worm here, and now he can potentially get the heal onto his Stampede Kodo as well. In fact, I might have even liked leaving up the Mana Worm. Oh. Oh. I know, I know. Ambitious. But then he, he, he gets rewarded and trades into it and gets it. Because you're getting eight heal, and you're going to take at least three. <laughs> Look at this hand, though. That Mana Worm eights you next turn if you leave it alive. Like, you do not net healing. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So I suppose you're correct. Yeah. All right, well, Snow's just drawing cards. <laughs> That's all he's been doing the whole game, it feels. Uh, Cabal's Tomes giving him cards. Mm -hmm. Arcane Intellect drawing him cards. The couple threats that he's played, which it, there hasn't been many, nope. have been killed very quickly and without remorse. I mean, really, how many threats are there in this deck? There are, like, just purely the minions. There is two mirror, two mana worms. Sure, those are threats. Blood Mage, not really a threat. Cold Sorcerer can get some work done. Sorcerer's Apprentices. Flame Wakers are legitimate threats. And then you have Drakes, Emperor, Yogg-Saron. Like, That's it. Yeah, there's, there's just, like, you're not going to stick stuff to the board and do repetitive damage with this deck. Like, the plan is just burn the face. And when you're playing against a deck that has persistent onboard healing in the form of Ragnaros Light Lord and just burst healing with Forbidden Heals and all that business, as well as Ivory Knights? Like, is that plan going to work? Not usually. No. But, you know, that this deck with double Kabbalist Tome that gives you eight extra spells. Uh, well, six, since you normally play another spell in the place of that, mm -hmm. uh, for Yogg-Saron. So you do just get more straight-up spells from Yogg. So let's look at damage in the hand real quickly. There is the 10 from the Pyroblast, which you'll have to spend an entire turn on. And he has Fireball, Frostbolt for nine more, Hi. plus two Arcane Missiles, which, you know, let's be optimistic and say those do four to face or something crazy. He's going to need some something special from this Flame Waker here to be able to uh, make sure he has enough damage to push through. All right, well, if using Burn on big stuff like this usually means that you're on the Yacht plan. Yeah. Uh, you're just hoping that you can survive long enough and play enough spells to where Yogg just does ridiculous things. Right. And it feels like he built his deck in a way that he has better chances against control, control decks with Cabal's Tome. And also has Yogg, which gets more value from Cabal's Tome to really blow you out of the game. I really, really like this play from Dog here as well, because he's, he's incorrect in his exact read, but I think he's identified the exact same thing that you just did, which is that looks like a setting up Yogg turn that my opponent just did on the previous turn. So I can, pr I can play around Yogg to an extent by playing Sylvanas and threatening to steal his Yogg and his spell effects for my own. Unfortunately for him, his timing was just a little bit off. No Yogg in hand just yet, so Snow will have time to clear up that Sylvanas first. Mm -hmm. And Dog has... His board is going to be a little bit vulnerable over the next couple turns. Snow can clear, but do. he's starting to run out of cards, and do. there's still a lot of gas up for Dog. He hasn't hit his Tyrion yet, so Nazoth is still probably not on the table as far as plays go, because once this board is removed, it will only be Sylvanas. Yep. 
Um, but he has wild pyromancer quality if Snow were to build up a, a really weird board. Right. Uh, he, he does have humility if Yogshron comes out and just does something ridiculous, but he, he doesn't want a quality yet. So, we'll see. Yeah, it's looking really, really tricky for him because, like you said, even if, as you said, he's on he's on the Yogg plan, but even if Yogg were to come out and cast, you know, a bunch of Call of the Wilds and Stand Against Darkness and all that kind of stuff, while Pyro Equality is there, so it's going to be uh, slightly difficult for him to establish a board. He's going to need something like Death Rattle effects, like a Soul of the Forest on a generated board from Yogg-Saron, something as ridiculous as that. But you know what? Stranger things have happened when the card Yogg-Saron is involved. Yes. They they have. Yes, they have. So, uh, Seal of Champions is used on the Sylvanas. It seems like a weird play considering Tempo Mage has a lot of ways to just deal sort of one or very little <laughs> on demand damage. Uh oh. All three to face. Face. Okay. face. Fa oh. 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 All right, so the Sylvanas is clear, but we honestly, Dog might be just hard on the read right now that Yogg is in hand for his opponent and is unplayable because there's some of those cards on the on the far left, which maybe he's lost track of as Kabbalist Tome cards. So we might see him just Nazoth here for another Sylvanas potentially, although now the Emperor is up, that probably demands attention. Yeah, the Emperor as well. And if you play Nazoth and just get back Sylvanas, the Emperor just gets a free trade into mm -hmm. the Sylvanas. Sure. And so you sort of waste that part of the Nazoth. Either you want to play it. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess he has, he has no way in hand apart from actually committing sure. a quality to this board of dealing with the Emperor. So I guess he's just decided, sure. You know what? I have no way of dealing with this Emperor. I'll let my Sylvanas do it. Yeah. And I guess this is sort of a, a way to remove it. Yeah forcing your not forcing your opponent to trade but encouraging your opponent to trade into it and what maybe do? i don't know what i feel like do? sylvanas is so crucial to the later stages of the game because an interaction that's that's pretty widely known but not known by everybody is if you have sylvanas on the board and your opponent plays yogsaron mm -hmm. if your sylvanas dies yogsaron switches do? allegiance what and all of a sudden do? all of the spells that are cast are yours yep which for a lot of spells doesn't matter because they all have random targets anyway, but for some spells it really does. Right, I mean, that's the exact reason why, why Yogg-Saron started to become such a staple is that people realize that the alts were actually tilted in the favor of the spellcaster to get favorable outcomes. So when you re reverse that equation, suddenly Yogg is nowhere near as effective as it could be. Mm -hmm. And so now Sylvanas is gone. There is uh, no way to bring her back, sadly. Mm. And Snow's just going to rope. Do nothing? Uh, awkward, I, I guess. He's I mean, I, I really hope this isn't a DC. Looking at his face, he doesn't look frustrated or bewildered about the situation or he's anything. He's still moving so, around. Yeah, so this... His, he's not calling anybody his attention. Right, his webcam is still connected, so... Okay. In, so a bizarre ending to game one, but all in all, the Tempo Mage deck performed about as well as we expected it to. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, a little bit weird, but uh, he was pretty far behind, I guess, maybe realizing that he... Uh, yeah, okay. Well, uh, we did get word that it was a disconnect, so... Uh, oh, it was. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, he will be s uh, still given a loss, though, because he didn't have lethal present on board, so... Unless there's a regame, we'll get uh, full confirmation on that in a second. But that was a, a disconnect. Interesting, considering he he was we could see him on screen mm. moving around, didn't seem to call anybody to attention. A little bit odd. But back to the drawing board, I guess. Yep. I mean, he's he, one way or another. I mean, that tempo mage is gonna have to find a win. And sure, we've we've been giving it a hard time, maybe maybe too severely. Personally, I don't I think so. I think we're probably going a little bit easy on the deck. Um, but He's going to have to find a win with it somewhere because of the nature of Conquest. He's just going to have to keep queuing that until he picks up a win somewhere. It's going to struggle. Yeah, I think uh, so too. Dog's lineup is probably one of the ones where it can do the best, mm -hmm. but it still just doesn't have great matchups. You have to get a really fast start against some of these control decks, and his deck isn't designed to get a fast start. Uh, he cuts some of the early game uh, damage potential, like uh, the Colt Sorcerer. Yep in favor of having more late game spells with mm -hmm. Cabal's Tome. 
just having Cabal's Tome in your deck makes it more likely you draw it early on, which is su a super slow. You're not guaranteed to get damage spells from Cabal's Tome, which right. we saw there. He got some useless secrets sometimes. Yeah, Ice Barrier. So you have to get a really fast start. I'm really worried about the matchup against the Control Shaman mm -hmm. because you don't have a way to, to direct remove some of the big threats, especially if they get Ancestral Spirit. You have to get Polymorph or Polymorph Boar from Cabalist Tome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so some of the matchups, I mean, Tempo Mage can actually do okay as kind of a, a control buster with the right build if it can just overrun people, but the, the list that you want to be able to do that is not the Ice Block Cabalist Tome list. It's the play things, put a bunch of burn in my deck, draw that burn, kill you. Like, that's that's the deck that you want to be playing if you want to start beating up on some of these decks like Yogg Druid and Control Shaman, for example. And then you at least have the out of just pushing all in hard, hoping they have a slow start and just running them over. But when you're playing a slow list as well, but the things that you do with your slowness in the mid game and late game just aren't as powerful as some of the things that other mm. decks are doing, then I just, I don't see how well placed the deck is overall. Definitely, definitely, great points. And we did get word that Snow has decided to take the loss for that disconnect. Uh, so Dog will be rewarded the win. Uh, so he'll get the win with this Paladin deck. Nice. And uh, yeah, Snow has got to fight from behind now. I feel like that's the way that that match was going anyway. Uh, probably why Snow decided to take the loss for that disconnect it was Definitely in favor of Dog. I would say the only way that Snow possibly would have been able to win was a crazy Yogg. Literally the world's greatest Yogg, yeah. Yeah, it, and it wouldn't even have to, it would either have to just kill him outright or make a board that was like Soul of the Forested twice. Right, and I, th I think, honestly, we have to commend him for that because he literally said himself, we're getting word that, you know, I don't think I was in any spot to win that mm -hmm. game, so I'm just going to give up the loss because, you know, the way the rules are stated, I think he was in his rights to try and demand a regame since there he was not faced with lethal. He literally had Ice Block in play. Like, you mm -hmm. cannot be faced with lethal. So he would have been in his rights to kick up a fuss and try and get a regame, but he's accepted that that game was over, so I think hats off to him in the end. Indeed. Uh, so while we wait for them to get reset a little bit, I want to talk to you a little bit. Ooh. Yeah, I let's know. Let's do it. Let's, let's riff, TJ. Let's get real. Yeah. Let's just sit back and get real. Uh, there's been a lot of mages in the Americas prelim as opposed to the Europe prelim. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, I think, like 30 more or something like that. And a lot of them are tempo. Yeah. Why has tempo mage all of a sudden increased in popularity so much after a week of of play is it the region's differences is there something in the water is it <laughs> is it really firelands portal I mean, uh, Firelands Portal helps. I think it's one of the, the stronger cards in the, in the first wing of the expansion, for sure, you know, alongside Ivory Knight, Cloaked Huntress, that kind of thing. If you look at the, the ladder stats on, on Data Reaper, for example, Tempo Mage is actually the most popular deck on ladder on the recent report as well. So people are obviously seeing some merit to it. And I think when you, when you look at some of the things that you're expecting to see in this tournament, like I said before, you know, can, Tempo Mage can be built in particular ways that can be up on some of those kind of clunky mid-range decks with their slower starts. It can sure. also be very, very effective at taking on, for example, Dragon Warrior and, uh, and Shaman. If you get the, the spell damage Arcane Blast start, if you mulligan for the right spells, I think people tend to suffer in those matchups a lot for it because they will just mulligan for minions and they play minions and then they get hit with Fiery War Axe or Rock by a Weapon. And they're like, oh, this, this matchup sucks. I can't win this matchup. Mm -hmm. But if you just mulligan for the removal and just neutralize their early threats in those matchups, then your mid game and such is actually a lot more powerful than what they can do most of the time. So I think it's a pretty well-placed deck overall. Tempo Mage is one of the toughest decks, I think, to play in the current form of Hearthstone. Uh, it's gotten a lot tougher. It's not the same as you just barf your, your hand with <laughs> with uh, Flame Waker and just go to town uh, as it once was. But Temple Mage always sneaks in there as one of those decks that's competitive. Yeah. We look back to the 2015 Regional Championships. There was a couple player to bring Temple Mage and have some success, uh, most notably uh, Jab and Hot Form in yep. Americas. Hot Form made it all the way to the finals of the 2015 World Championship with a Temple Mage deck. Mm -hmm. It's a deck that sort of sneaks up there when nobody really expects it. The players that can pilot it at a high level always seem to do well and uh it's a deck that i'm looking i'm looking forward to seeing those 
those Firelands portals. <laughs> it was, it's always been a deck that's been hotly contested in terms of how aggressive is this deck supposed to be. Because you know, we're, we're both here sat on the, the side of the argument that you're just supposed to play things and kill your opponent. But even even back then, we were seeing some people like Nexus Champion Serad in the deck, which is just another card advantage engine, whereas other people were playing Grand Crusader, which is more of a tempo card because it's a big body that generates the card immediately. So even back then, there was kind of this dichotomy of you know how controlling is this deck, how aggressive is this deck, and that's kind of the thing. Like it's kind of just rides that halfway point between a control mage and an aggro mage, right? It's just the the way the deck is built. Yeah. So it kind of comes down to like which way you want to tilt the list. Yeah. Firelands portal uh, replaces flame strike in most lists. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of times in most matchups, you want a large card that gets a lot of value that also gains tempo. Where flame strike is not. A lot of times you flame strike, then they just refill, and you're caught in the same situation. Mm -hmm. Um. But let's move on. Uh, we're still waiting on the players to get their <laughs> things sorted out. You don't out. say. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to move on, actually, and talk about a different deck list. And I'm going to bring up another deck list here that uh, has been pretty much America-specific. It was brought by very few players yes. in Europe. And America's, it's incredibly popular. It's almost as popular as Dragon Warrior, yeah. which is crazy to me, yeah. considering how much Dragon War we saw at Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Cycle Cthune. Right. Cycle Thune. Cycle Cy Cy Yeah, that, that one. Yes. Yep. Uh, Cycle Cthune deck. It's basically the. Uh, I, I, I want to say Kalento was one of the first pl players to play it. I think so. At yeah. least in front of a wide audience. Yeah. And it's basically just your whole entire deck is Cycle. And then you input Cthune stuff. Mm -hmm. And your win condition against a lot of decks is you just go through your whole deck, all 30 cards, you Emperor Thorsan, you Brand Doomcaller, and then your last two cards are Cthune after your Cthune died. Yeah, and then you just like 40 them with two Cthunes at the end. It's great. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous, but the thing about it is it works. It does, yeah. And I think one of the things that became apparent to me when uh, uh, Neville's made his big breakout with the OTK Worgen that then other people started to pick up as well is the Pyromancer Commanding Shout Engine is just kind of ridiculous. It is. Like, you can do absurd things with that combination. Um, so suddenly when you start relying on that to be your AoE, uh, that is a an AoE engine that also draws you cards when you combine it with the fact that commanding shout cycles, you're activating battle rage, you can drop an acolyte at the same time to really go ham on cards. So suddenly the fact that you're cycling with your AoE engine means that you don't need to have brawl in your deck and suddenly you have all these deck slots open that you can experiment with and you end up with all these crazy decks. In this case, we're seeing you know, Cthune as a win condition, but we're seeing decks in the second wing, for example, being experimented with, it's, hey, just Arcane Giants. Like, I'm just going to play some zero mana 8-8s eight at the end of all this, and it's that just crazy. seems fine. So I think the big takeaway is that we've all been sleeping on Pyromancer Commanding Shout for way too long. Like, that combination of cards should have been being played in Warrior for a very long time. A very long time. It got help with cards like Blood to Icker. Yeah, of course. Um, and there was another card, I can't remember what it was, but it was another card that was like, wow, people never played this card because yeah. it was always considered bad, but... Uh, yeah, and I think people saw the OTK Worgen deck and they thought the OTK Worgen part of it was the part that made it strong. Like, yeah. wow, Warrior just has good removal, and then, wow, OTK Worgen is just crazy. Yeah. But it was actually that draw, that removal engine. And so you can really just put any inevitable win condition in <laughs> with this package of draw slash removal. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for someone to... Fine. So what what's another inevitable win condition? Don't say Yogg's are on. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. Preempted. Sniped. Yeah. What the hell. I mean, yeah. The Molten Giant's Charge was the classic one, right? Mm -hmm. So now that is replaced with with Arcane Giant's Charge uh, for a similar effect. I mean, there, there aren't that many. I mean, Bli Blizzard and, and Team Five are, are pretty stringent on non-interactive and uh, non-interactive win, win conditions. conditions yeah they're like well if you just get to play these cards and win the game we're, we're probably going to take your fun away i'm waiting for the uh day where warrior gets like a, a couple extra spells that go face because mm -hmm. then malagos warriors are just going to be insane malagos warrior right now they have mortal strike mm. anything else bash Bash! Ooh. Yeah, we're, we're, we're big money. We're already there. We just need to. <laughs> we just need a two mana spell. So wait, you damage Maybe yourself. Three you damage, damage yourself down. So Mortal Strike's doing eleven, and then Bash is doing eight. That's nineteen. You can play two copies of those, and then Emperor them. 
We're already there, TJ. What there. are you worried about? <laughs> and then you just put in the removal slash draw package, Boom. and you're good to go. Yeah. We just made a, a new archetype on stream. Wow. Let's build it right now. We can we can stream that while we're waiting for the game to start. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, we can't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> but what we can do is we can check in with Cora, who's going to give us some info uh, by the blackboard. Thank you very much, TJ and Saddle. I'm at the blackboard, joined with Admirable. And while we're waiting for the next match to get set up, we thought we'd just give you guys a little bit of an overview on how the rest of the players are doing so far in the tournament.